Good morning, everyone. I guess if you want to shift around, you can, or you can stay where you are with your new friend. Um, so my name is Tom Izu, and uh, what I'm, what we're very, very fortunate to have a very special guest speaker. And one thing I wanted to mention, is if I could borrow one of these, is that these things have, uh, the title of our event is uh, Planting Our Legacy, not growing up, planting our legacy. And um, I remember when I was a kid and I saw these seed packets. And I think the ones I saw a long time ago, I even had Japanese on it. So I thought all seed packets are supposed to look like this when I was a little kid. It was here in San Jose in some of the nurseries around here. And so th that's part of what kind of uh, triggered this idea of doing a discussion about this. Keep this out, seed company has been here since I think 1917 and has a history here in San Jose. And um, in fact, if you're interested later, I work at the California History Center, and we have copies of some of the uh, little brochures they used to pass out, 1927, 1928. And you can see, and our guest speaker, maybe you can see if they still have some of the same seats here. But they've been around a really long time, and they're a very important part of our, our legacy. And so connecting our own legacy of those of us connected to Japanese American community, interested in the Japanese American community, and actually trying to figure out how to do something. Like I, I've heard some discussion before, do you have a green thumb? I do not have a green thumb. And uh, my partner here I met, he said he does not have a green thumb. But I know some of you actually are pretty experienced gardeners. So this is just all an effort to get us to talk and have some fun at the same time. But <clears throat> to help us is our very special guest, Jim Hugo, who is a co-owner of Kitazawa Seeds. And this is their catalog here, which I really encourage you to take a look at. And, and Jim is going to share a little bit about his own experience and why he became part of this company and share some of his knowledge. So he came all the way from Oakland and we're really, really glad that he could come. It's probably one of the most busy times of the year for you to come out here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, my name is Jim Ryugo, uh, co-owner of Kitazawa Seed Company. Uh, this is our catalog from last year, but this is the Kiju Kitazawa, the man in the coveralls. Uh, obviously he's a working man, and the gentleman in the suit uh, was the accountant. <laughs> anyway, this is a storefront from uh, San Jose, California. Uh, I'm not related to the Kitazawa family, but I feel like they're part of my family. Uh, Jiju Kitazawa and his brother Bioman uh, came to San Jose uh, probably in the early 1900s and they started Kitazawa Seed Company and Nursery uh, here in San Jose around 1917. Um, at some point there was some sort of split in the family. Uh, Jiju took the seed company and the brother took the, uh, the nursery. Uh, you can see on these historic documents that there are two addresses. One was for the nursery and one was for the uh, seed company. Uh, Jiju Kitazawa was a trainee and learned his seed skills from a Japanese seed company when he was a younger man before he immigrated to the U.S. Um, he sold seeds uh, and again looking at some of the the documents here, he sold both U.S. grown or U.S. produced seeds. I believe he was probably producing his own seeds as well as bringing in seeds from Japan because if you didn't grow your own vegetables, like Japanese vegetables in particular, you wouldn't eat Japanese vegetables because there wasn't a supermarket that carried them. And that's same philosophy holds true today because a lot of our customers are in rural parts of the United States and if they want a Japanese cucumber, guess what? They have to grow it themselves. There's no Chinatown or even a Safeway nearby that would have Japanese eggplant or Japanese cucumbers or any other Asian vegetable. So our company is based upon you know, selling seeds, and we basically sell seeds to whoever has a zip code, basically, because we ship everything by mail. But in the early uh, 1900s, uh, it was really difficult you know, making a living selling seeds. So the Kitazawas, they had to travel up and down 
the state selling their seeds to, to farmers. Uh, I want to digress a little bit and talk about uh, an important person who is a Kitazawa man, a family member. Her name was Mei Kitazawa. She was born here in San Jose, went to school in San Jose, started San Jose State College, and then the war broke out. The Kitazawa family was sent off to Hart Mountain in Wyoming to camp, and they were in this camp for several years. Um, interestingly enough, the Hart Mountain uh, camp, the first thing they had to do, because it was out in the middle of nowhere, they had to build, uh, construct a 5,000 linear foot irrigation ditch to provide water to where they're going to grow their vegetables. And in the first year, 1943, the camp produced over a thousand tons of vegetables in the first year. And it surprised the local farmers because they got off to a late start, but still they had a really bountiful uh, harvest. The camp also had um, cows, uh, pigs, and chickens. So I suspect they were growing alfalfa, corn, and other grains to feed the, the animals, which are also part of you know the, the food supply. Um, in 19, that was 1943. 1944, the camp produced over 2,500 tons of food, and the camp was considered the most productive of all the camps. And I think part of it is because there were a lot of farmers there, including the Kitazawas, who had a lot of knowledge about how to grow vegetables, which made it uh, successful. But going back to Mei Kitazawa, she was able to leave camp and went to Oberlin College, where she got a degree in botany. And then she went on to Cornell University to get a master's degree in, in ornamental horticulture. And Mei was one of the first women in the master's or in the graduate program at Cornell, and was probably the first Asian American woman in the program. She finished her master's and then came to UC Berkeley to get a master's degree in landscape architecture. And she got married and she uh, started using her husband's name, which was Arbogast. So May Arbogast taught at UC Berkeley and she would take her classes up to this little, not little, but this private uh, estate in the Berkeley Hills, actually it was in Kensington. And it was part of the Blake family uh, estate. Well, the Blakes didn't have any uh, children, so they donated this estate to UC Berkeley's uh, Department of Landscape Architecture. Um, and then May Arbogast became the first director of this Blake Garden. So if you ever happen to be in Berkeley and you're looking for something interesting to do, I strongly suggest you take a field trip to Blake Gardens in Kensington and take a look at it. It's just a beautiful garden. It's open to the public. And it's just an interesting thing to, to enjoy. And also to think about the fact that here is this Kitazawa family member who played a significant role in the creation of the, the landscaping that's on this garden as well as the transfer of the property to UC Berkeley. But May also had a, another influence locally here with Fioli Gardens. And if you've been to Fioli Gardens, May Arbogast was one of the founding members of the group to transfer the uh, estate from the family to the uh, the federal government, and it's now uh, kind of a nationally known place of historic importance. So again, if you've never been to Fioli Garden, I strongly suggest you take a field trip there. It's a beautiful place to see. There's a lot of history there. Um, there's kind of a representation of what uh, families with wealth back in the day, how they lived. But it's just interesting because, again, there's this tie-in with the Kitazawa family. How many spell the gardens? Blake Garden. Fioli. F I. I L O L I. It's in Woodside, California. So it's probably I don't know half hour away from here maybe. 
So anyway, I digressed a little bit, but that was uh, mm -hmm. May Kitazawa, uh, or May Arrigas, is a really influential landscape architect. Uh, she also um, did landscape architecture for uh, business people who are looking for a kind of summer or weekend retreat in the Napa Valley area. This is back in the 1970s when land in Napa Valley was relatively inexpensive. So people from the Bay Area with looking for a second home, they were buying up these plots of, of basically vineyards in Napa. And May advised them to continue using or planting grapes around their estates. And that was the beginning of some of these small private wineries that you still see today that were part the ownership was was kept intact because these investors bought these homes for kind of their summer residence. And so it's interesting this, again to see this tie in for how one person kind of influenced the landscaping here in California. So let me get back to the seed company. Um, after the war, there isn't a whole lot of information about how the company ran, but I can, I can surmise that after the war, a lot of the Japanese American farmers were displaced. They came back and they, they had lost everything. They lost their farms in many cases. Uh, in other cases, they relocated, and so it became really difficult to reinvent oneself after the war, but the Kitazawa did. Uh, they continued to produce uh, a catalog. Uh, back then and even today, uh, seed catalogs are very uh, important. You, you get a catalog in the mail, you carry it around with you, you read it in bed, you take it outside <laughs> with you. I mean, it, it's something that's a really important part of you know, the marketing of seeds. Um, at some point in time, the business was uh, taken over by the Kitazawa's son-in-law. His name is uh, Sky Komatsu. And Sky Komatsu and his wife Helen ran the company here in San Jose. But Sky unexpectedly died, and his wife Helen uh, tried to keep the company going. Now Helen was a, was a trained nurse, and she worked in a hospital, and she retired. And so she depended upon family members to help her carry on the, the seed company. But in 1999, they're having a hard time getting their seed out to uh, retail stores. And my father-in-law, who lived in the Central Valley, called and said, you know, I can't get any seeds at uh, the Japanese store in Fresno. Can you do me a favor and go to San Jose and get my vegetable seeds because I really need them? And no one's answering the phones and I, I just can't get my seeds. And he was really upset. So my wife drove to San Jose, met with Helen, and Helen just, ex just described how hard it was. The family members didn't show up to help pack seed. Uh, they're getting orders that she couldn't fulfill. She's just having a hard time. And she said, you know, I'm ready to close the doors. And my wife said, well, you know, you, you can't really close the doors because you're such an important part of, of Japanese American history and part of serving the community. So if you ever decide you want to sell, just give me a call because I might be interested in, in taking over or buying the company. So exactly two, a year later, it was Mother's Day 2000, we were having a family g gathering at our house, my parents, uh, Maya's parents came over for lunch, and we get this phone call from Helen. And she said, I'm fed up. Uh, I can't take this anymore. I, I need to close the door. If you want to buy the business, you can buy the business. But the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back was her mimeograph machine died. <laughs> so it gives you an idea that this is really a, a, an old company that was still barely hanging on. Uh, so the summer of 2000, uh, we purchased the seed company, moved it to Oakland. We operated it out of our home office um, in a spare bedroom. 
back then, in, in two, early 2000, uh, orders came in by mail. We, we uh, processed people's checks. Uh, we never had a bounce check. Sometimes cash came in the mail to buy seeds. It was really uh, a, a personal relationship in terms of the customers that we were, we were um, serving. In 2004, we decided to um, switch gears and get away from mail order, well not get away from it, but supplement our, the mail order with um, an, a website. And creating a website with our, uh, with our seed offerings really changed everything for us. All of a sudden we were getting inquiries from all over the world <laughs> about how do we get seeds. And at that point it's like, there's something wrong here because we, we just want to sell seeds you know, locally or, or at least within the US. We, we can't sell seeds to England or Mexico or other places. But anyway, uh, the number of customers just increased dramatically by having a, a web address and selling seeds through the internet. And even today, we, we continue to get new customers because they find us on the web. They were looking for a certain variety of vegetables and uh, it's a very competitive market, but at the same time, it's like who answers the phone first is probably going to be, you know, the person who's going to make the sale. And then uh, in terms of customer service, we try and uh, get our seeds out the day that the um, order comes in. So with shipping by U.S. Priority Mail, uh, it's a little more expensive, but uh, people in California can get their seeds within two days. Sometimes it's one day, uh, depending upon the mail. Uh, customers on the East Coast can get their seeds in three to four days, depending upon the weather. And so we've created a, a system where people order their seeds and they get the seeds pretty quickly. And that's what they're looking for because there's nothing worse than someone who is waiting patiently to get their seeds. And if they don't get the seeds, you'll get the call, you'll get the complaint, what's taking so long, I need my seeds right now. <laughs> and again, the sooner we get the seeds out, uh, the better it is for us. So a lot of people will ask us, well, what's, what's your most best-selling seed? Can anyone guess what it might be? Our best-selling seed is shishito pepper seeds. It's, it's very popular. Um, shishito peppers are something that uh, more and more you, you see them even being sold in uh, Trader Joe's. It's, it's so popular. Um, the story behind shishito peppers, though, is something that really you have to think about history of man and how things have evolved over time. Because the pepper seed, because that's the hottest part of the chili. So researchers have been wondering, well, why why would there be this hot capsaicin <coughs> found around the seed? Well, it's something that evolved over time to protect the seed from predation. So when mammals try and eat a pepper, or bite into a pepper, the first thing they get is this blast of hotness that they won't want to eat it. So it's a way of preserving or protecting the most important thing in a plant, and that's the seed. And so, the, the hotness of the pepper is, is something that evolved over time, not through human intervention, but because nature, it was nature's way of protecting the, the seed from predation. And again, this is something that has evolved for a long period of time. Rodents can apparently, or birds can eat seeds with no problem, but rodents can't eat pepper seeds because it's too hot for them. So anyway, that's, that's how the seeds kind of the hotness of the peppers kind of evolved over time. So when Christopher Columbus was looking for a shortcut to Asia, he was looking for not gold or silver or gems, he was looking for a shortcut to find 
spices. So the spices that he was looking for would be things like mace uh, or nutmeg. Nutmeg is the actual seed. Mace is the covering of the seed. Um, black pepper, white pepper, um, vanilla. Uh, these are all found in Southeast Asia for the most part. And fetched a really high price in Europe. And so he was looking for that shortcut because whatever could reduce the travel time to get things back to Europe would, would mean a lot of money to somebody. <coughs> and so when he landed in uh, the Bahamas, you know, he noticed, well, first he noticed he, he didn't find anything that he could recognize that would be of value because hadn't landed in Asia, obviously. <laughs> but he did discover that the, the locals were eating really spicy foods. So he took peppers back to Spain. And the Spaniards grew peppers, but they didn't really, they thought it was more of a novelty than it was something that was, you know, something worth eating or promoting. But it was the Portuguese who took the peppers and started trading them across their colonies throughout the Mediterranean, across Africa, into Asia, uh, the Portuguese are spreading these pepper seeds and pepper plants. Again, trading peppers for, for spices from the Far East. So you have to think about, at some point, the peppers made their way to Japan. And at some point, the Japanese started breeding their own varieties of, of peppers to, to meet their particular palate. So the shishito pepper is known for being kind of a sweet tasting, thin skinned pepper. And maybe one in 10 shishito peppers might have a little bit of spice to it. But if you keep, if you keep breeding the shishito pepper yourself, year after year after year, you'll find it gets consistently hotter and hotter and hotter. <laughs> so again, the, the, the Japanese shishito pepper, they figure out a way to limit the amount of capsaicin that's being produced by having the right genetics behind it. But if you were to do it yourself, you can do a careful selection. Your shishito peppers in a couple of generations will be spicy hot. So going back to Asian vegetables, there's only one vegetable that is, quote, native to Japan, and that's the Mitsuba. Uh, everything else came from other parts of the world. Um, so when, when you talk about Japanese vegetables in general, I have to talk about um, kind of the, the history of Japan. I'm going to give you a real quick overview. You know, Japan as an island was very isolated from the rest of the world. And within Japan, the, the lands were basically controlled by powerful families and feudal lords. And if you were a farmer, you worked for the lord or the, the family. You didn't own the property. The, fam the, the feudal families owned the property and ultimately it was the shogun who owned everything. Or the emperor, I'm sorry, the emperor owned everything. So within, within feudal Japan, you didn't trade with other provinces or people of the other areas because they were your enemy for the most part. So every province or every area kind of developed their own vegetables that were adapted to their climate, adapted to their palate, and very rarely did it get exchanged elsewhere. So some very uh, distinctive vegetable flavors were created within Japan. And this is all possible because uh, over the course of years, the farmers had learned what grew well, what was the best flavor, and if, you know, if the boss didn't like what you're growing, guess what, you can be out of a job. So it became very important to produce you know, food that tasted good. But also land in Japan is really scarce. So there's small amounts of land that you have to be very productive to feed a, a growing population. And it wasn't until the, 
1853 uh, that Americans finally landed in Japan and started <coughs> talking about trade. And it was about the time when um, changes were taking place in Japan and trade started opening up with the rest of the world. Uh, when World War II took place, a lot of things changed after that. Um, the pressure to produce more food meant more science had to be used to produce those foods. So plant breeding in the, in the 50s and even the early 60s was taking place all over the world, especially here in the United States where uh, places like Cornell, UC Davis, and other universities are doing a lot of research into how do we produce vegetables quicker, faster, uh, tasted better. And so all this research was in and around plant breeding. So the Cole family, or Brassica family as we call it, is probably the most important of all the vegetables uh, families uh, because it, it just provides a wide range of vegetables. So when you talk about a uh, brassica with large leaves, you're talking about the cabbage family. If you're talking about brassicas that have a, a big root, a swollen root with a lot of nutrients and carbohydrates in the roots, those are all called turnips. And if you're gonna eat the leaves for like spiciness, those would be like uh, mustard greens. And if you're gonna use the seeds to make things like mustard, those are called rapa seeds. So this big family of, uh, of vegetables has been uh, the basis for a lot of plant breeding to bring us to here today with all the different vegetables that we eat. So probably the most important cabbage or not for cabbage uh, in the Japanese diet um, is the Chinese cabbage or Napa cabbage. And the Napa cabbage, um, again, were bred especially from different parts of Japan. And in our catalog, we, you can see different varieties that come from different parts of, of Japan because of the certain flavor, flavor profiles that the, the farmers wanted to create. So Napa cabbage is something that is pretty easy to grow. I've got some seedlings here that, um, this is like the Kyoto variety. And I just put these in the ground or in these little containers about uh, two weeks ago. They were left outside, no special, no special care or anything. It's, it's all about timing. Um, <clears throat> and a little bit of luck on my part. <laughs> but na Napa cabbages are a cool season plant. Japan is a country that is, is really cool for the most part. Um, and, and kind of the northern latitudes. But here in San Jose, I would say uh, you could probably grow Napa cabbage almost all year round with a little bit of luck. Um, it does best in the temperatures between 50 and 70 degrees. And so in Oakland, San Jose, if you look at the weather charts, you'll see that probably in, in March, the, the low temperature is probably 50 degrees. And that kind of gives you a clue that you can probably grow some of these, not by cabbages, even though it's still rainy out and it feels cold and damp outside. But for, for Chinese cabbage, as an example, it will grow. It will germinate even when it's cool. Uh, Japanese or, or Chinese cabbages come in all different shapes and sizes. Typically, uh, they're grown for either putting in soup or they can be stir-fried. Some people will eat the, the baby leaves uh, in salad, and they can also be uh, pickled as well. And Judy and I were talking about pickling, and we can talk about pickling in a little bit, but um, pickling is one of the important ways that uh, food can be preserved for future use. 
Also within the Brassica family are pak choys, or bok choys if you want to call them that. Uh, pak choys come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. The most common one is probably the white stem pak choy, which you see in, in like uh, chow mein. The white stem is, is very desirable, it's crisp, it's cut crunchy. Uh, there's also the green stem variety, which you can also find in Chinatown. Um, again, they come in different shapes, sizes. Uh, it tolerates cool weather. If the weather all of a sudden gets hot, though, it's probably going to start that process of flowering or, or bolting, and it's, it's not going to be uh, good to eat once it starts that flowering process because all the nutrient and energy goes into the flower and it's being pulled away from the leaves. So you can still eat something that's flowering, but just know that it's, it's not as optimal. So Japanese turnips are another really popular vegetable seed that we sell, but turnips themselves probably originated in the Mediterranean area of, of the world. And again, traded and migrated throughout uh, into China, India, and Japan. Uh, turnips are an important part of the Japanese diet. Um, typical Japanese turnips are pure white. They're really crispy. They're probably maybe two to three inches in diameter. Um, I like just to boil them real quickly in um, chicken broth and they're done in like three to four minutes. So it's real quick and easy to cook them uh, if you're in a hurry, like I'm in a hurry most of the time. <laughs> but it's also very nutritious as well. The turnip tops are also edible. You just don't cut them off and, and compost them. I like to stir fry the turnip tops. And probably uh, there's a lot of nutrient value um, in the turnip tops. So when you buy turnips at the store, Think about you know, using all of it. Uh, komatsuna is considered a Japanese vegetable, but it probably came from, its root probably came from China, because it was a cross of some sort between pak choys. But komatsuna originated in a little town near Tokyo, and it's called Komatsuna Gawa. And in this area, uh, Komatsuna has been in production for over 300 years. So here in the United States, we consider an heirloom vegetable being in production for 50 years or more. <laughs> so when you think about <coughs> Japan's history and some of these vegetables being in production for 300 years, it really, you know, what we call heirlooms is really dwarfed by what's been in production in Japan for so long. Uh, Mizuna and Nibuna are closely related Japanese vegetables. Um, the difference kind of is how, they, how it looks and the shape of the leaves. And again, these are vegetable greens that were developed in Japan, primarily for uh, ease of growing and how quickly they mature. Uh, you can harvest these vegetables in 30 to 40 days at full maturity. You can certainly harvest the leaves at an earlier time by just clipping the outer leaves, leaving the central part of the plant to continue growing, but you can harvest the leaves um, almost continuously. Uh, kales and collard greens are also part of the same brassica family. Um, we've all seen kale salad and kale chips and all different variations of kale. But it's interesting, I was just reading that um, if you're eating kale, cook your kale. Because when you cook the kale, it releases a lot of the nutrients that are available in the leaves. But surprisingly enough, when you eat kale raw, we don't digest everything. That there are certain uh, vitamins and minerals that are locked up within the kale that doesn't get released until you cook it. Anyway, just something you know to think about. We sell a lot of kale seed. Uh, it's used for microgreens primarily. When I say microgreens, it's for the little short um, plants that get harvested really quickly, probably after maybe 10 to 12 days, depending on the circumstances. But um, 
kale is a really important part of our business because it, it's in such high demand. <coughs> Chinese broccoli is also in that same family. Chinese broccoli, I'm sure you've all have had it, like in a Chinese restaurant, it's got the big stalk, it's crunched, it's sweet. You, you hardly see the leaves because it's the stem that's been developed to be sweet and crunchy, and that's what is desirable about the Chinese broccoli. The leaves are edible, but it's really the stalk that is most desired. Um, other greens, uh, Asian greens, Chinese celery is similar to Western celery, but Chinese celery tends to have a little bit stronger flavor to it. Um, Chinese celery is used in all sorts of soups and sautés. You can uh, grow Chinese celery for microgreens. You can also grow them to full-size plants. Uh, cilantro or, or Chinese parsley is also something that has become really popular. Um, cilantro is used heavily in, uh, in Mexico and, and, and uh, Central American cuisine. So the cilantro leaf is what you'd find like in guacamole or in salsa. But the seed from the Chinese parsley is called coriander, which is used as an herb. Same plant, just different, different way of harvesting it. Uh, cilantro is really common in Chinese uh, and Indian cuisines. And coriander is used for the pickling process to give some flavoring to uh, your pickling. So I brought a sample of uh, something out of my yard. <laughs> this is a shinkiku, or edible uh, chrysanthemum. This is something that uh, you could find like in sukiyaki. Uh, some chefs will cut the leaf off, dip it in batter, and stir fry it. But this is something that's, I mean, this I think planted uh, probably in December. No special treatment, just started the seeds. We had a pretty warm, dry uh, December, so I kind of lucked out. But uh, really easy to grow. Uh, you can find this in stores, but um, and you're welcome to come by and taste it. But um, again, it's something that you can grow pretty easily. You just have to get your your garden together. Question. Question. Is that something when it flowers, it's not as um, Good, good. Yeah, it starts, as I mentioned, once a plant starts that flowering process, uh -huh. all the energy that has been saved up is now being directed to the flower parts. Uh -huh. So the taste does change. Typically, you would probably harvest this a little bit earlier okay. because there are some, uh, you can see the top here is kind of changing. It's getting ready to flower up here. Uh -huh. Uh, bunching onions are something that have been in, in the Chinese uh, agriculture for thousands of years. Uh, the Chinese bunching onions made it to, to Japan. Japanese bunching onions are very popular. Uh, we have many varieties of bunching onions. Uh, bunching onions is something that, if you've got the space, you can grow them almost all year round, and you just clip a couple leaves, put it into your soup or put it into your omelet or put it into your salad but it's pretty easy to grow and um, it's something that could be part of anyone's garden. Uh, perilla or shiso is a really important Japanese vegetable even though perilla is something that's found across the world. Uh, the green shiso is commonly seen on um, as a placeholder next to sushi, it's that green leaf that you see. Uh, you go to the store and uh, you can buy shiso leaves, buy the leaf. Sometimes it's like a dollar leaf, depending on the time of year. 
Uh, if you grow she so plant, it will get like this tall, just a bountiful number of leaves. Um, anyway, it's pretty easy to grow. Uh, the red she so uh, is an important food colorant, natural food colorant. So if you've ever eaten umeboshi, the red color from in the umeboshi came from shiso. And there's a whole process of using the natural colors of the uh, akashiso and using the color of the umeboshi. Um, oh, radishes and daikon. Uh, radishes probably originated in China and made their way into Japan. Uh, radishes are a real important part of the Japanese cuisine. Uh, radishes typically are the long tapered, they're 12 to 14 inches long, pure white, um, crunchy tap root. Uh, but I like it mostly in Takawan. Again, it's something that you, you pickle it, you preserve it. Uh, you can't possibly eat all of the daikon when it's when you harvest it in uh, either summer or, or spring. You just can't possibly eat it all. So you do, either you share it with friends or you pickle it. And so Judy and I were talking about pickling, and one of the things that um, I believe is that, and it's true, pick, pickling of vegetables has been something that mankind has been doing for centuries because we had to preserve your food for the winter, otherwise you would see starve. So the easiest way to pickle is basically salt. But we've been told, you know, you can't eat salt, salt's bad for you, it increases your blood pressure, blah, 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 which is, which is true. But also we've been ingesting a lot of food preservatives that have been come from chemical companies <coughs> and touted to be this, that, or the other. And so, you know, I, I think we have to pick, pick our poisons. And I would argue that pickling with salt has been something that man has evolved with and will continue to evolve with. But it is an important part of, of our diet. In Oakland, there's a company, that just a small little company that started up, and they teach classes how to pickle. And it's like, this is, this is really interesting because mm -hmm. I thought, People knew how to pickle. <laughs> or you have to go take a class in how to pickle. But again, I kind of grew up learning how to pickle, and it's just something that you know, we did. But pickling is something that uh, has become kind of a, a lost art that's being re rediscovered. And a lot of chefs are using uh, pickled vegetables <coughs> more and more because why? They have control over it. They can harvest the vegetables at the peak of their flavor. They can be preserved with, quote, natural processes. Um, they can be stored pretty easily. You don't need to refrigerate things once they've been pickled properly. And when you open it up, um, it tastes as good as it was, you know, several months earlier. So it's just something that to bear in mind that, uh, especially in the Japanese uh, palate, People have been eating pickled foods for centuries. And again, it's all in moderation. You know, if you overeat too much pickles, yeah, it could be a lot of salt intake. But as part of a balanced diet, I would say it's it's a good way of tasting or eating your vegetables during a time when you know, there wouldn't normally be a lot of vegetables available. And this is really important because in a lot of parts of the United States where especially in urban areas like in Oakland, there are areas of Oakland that don't have grocery stores. They have fast food places and they have corner markets, but the corner markets are selling basically packaged junk food. And so it creates this interesting <coughs> food issue because the reason why the corner grocery stores sell packaged foods is because it doesn't require refrigeration. And I would argue, you know, if if people pickled, you don't need refrigeration to store items that are pickled. And so here's an op opportunity in my mind for people to have access to fresh vegetables through pickling. And it can be distributed in 
all communities, and it, it would save energy, be more efficient in terms of storing, because you don't need to put it in a refrigerator, you can put it on the shelf. And I've been talking to people at UC Berkeley, and they're also thinking about the same thing. How do we address kind of this food issue, food justice issue, where they're trying to figure out all these different ways of delivering food, but you know, the missing link is something as basic as pickling. And again, pickling has been something everybody has been doing um, for a long period of time. Could be a partial solution to improving the quality of food in all the neighborhoods. You know, that's kind of my a, a side note, but it is something to, to kind of think about in terms of um, where are we going with, with our food. Uh, I brought some other samples out of the garden. Uh, this is kind of wilting. <laughs> So this is a, a mustard green. It's kind of a, a red mustard green, red giant mustard green. It's got a really thick, sturdy stalk. Um, it's beautiful in the garden. It's got this reddish color to it. And you can stir fry the leaves. Um, you can use the leaves in uh, a salad. You can also cut the leaves up and pickle it. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can use with um, mustard greens. Some people say that mustard green flavor is too hot and spicy. Uh, Japanese varieties will vary in the level of spiciness. But generally speaking, the older the leaf gets, the kind of the hotter, the spicier it gets. And you can always harvest the leaves, the outer leaves, when the plant is relatively young. And they'll be almost like eating lettuce because there's not a whole lot of spice in it. This other vegetable is, is more of a, uh, a Chinese variety, but it's called stem lettuce. And stem lettuce is grown for its stem. The stalk is really thick, you can see it. It's about an inch, inch and a half in diameter. You can chop it up. You can cook it, you can eat it raw. It has a flavor of lettuce, but it's just more filling because there's a lot of substance to the stem. The leaves are all edible. I mean, if you take a close look at the leaf, the leaf structure, it looks like a lettuce leaf. It's, it's all edible, but it's the, the thickened stalk that is, that is um, desired. So again, all these were started probably in uh, December or so, middle of winter, in Oakland, my backyard, nothing special. Now I know that one of your activities is going to be about starting seedlings. So these are seedlings that I started probably two weeks ago. These are Japanese, uh, like, I'm sorry, this is a Japanese uh, uh, turnip. But if you take a closer look at the, the seedlings, they almost look identical. Again, they're in the same family. They're different, different varieties. This uh, reddish color vegetable is a new variety that we're just trying to sell. It's, um, a, it's a red Chinese cabbage. Uh, but you can see there's a little green cabbage here that is kind of a, a mutant. <laughs> Genetic variability does exist, but this is really prized because of the red color, and this is the first time the red color has been bred into uh, a Chinese cabbage. Uh, it actually comes from Korea, and they've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to put more coloration into their vegetables because of the antioxidant properties that that vegetable colors have and the beneficial um, nutrients that uh, are an important part of our diet. So I, again, it's just something I, I want to share because you're going to start some seeds. 
and it's easy, relatively easy to do, but I'm also going to give you a couple of my tips. So this is kind of my system that I use. It's just a cookie tray so that if you spill anything or water drips down, it's not going to go on the floor. It's going to stay in the cookie sheet. And then the most important thing is this. This is a heating pad or a germination pad. You plug it in, it draws maybe 40 watts of power, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy, you can leave it plugged in without worrying about your electric bill. Um, and I just set it up underneath the, the uh, six pack of soil and seeds. And this will raise the temperature of the, of the soil to about 70 degrees, maybe 75 degrees. But the important thing is that it's a constant temperature and it's, it's warm. And so a lot of seeds will germinate, you know, when it's 50 degrees, 60 degrees. But at 70 degrees, a lot of things happen. You have to remember that the whole process of seed germination is a biochemical reaction that's taking place. There are things that are triggering the germination process. One is moisture, because if you put seeds in dry soil, they'll never germinate. <laughs> <laughs> if you put seeds in the cold soil, the seeds will not germinate, because it's not warm enough to start the biological processes needed to germinate. But when you have heat and moisture, kind of this magical combination of two factors, the seeds will germinate almost on schedule. So with the germination pad underneath your seedlings, you will get germination within three to five days. All the time, unless you have really bad seed. But for the most part, on a germination pad, you just need to put in, let's see, I just put in like two or three seeds in each cell, put it on a germination pad, and I'm going to get my results. So just something, I think the germination pad is like $20, $25. You can get them at nursery stores. You can get them online. They come in all different sizes if you want a, a bigger one. But that's probably the most important tool I use for germination. Um, again, if you think about the process, it's, it's all about the heat. I have a question about your germination pad. How often do you water? Uh, so, that's a good question. So, usually what I would do is, I have raised beds. And so, to minimize the transplant shock when I put the seedling into my raised bed, I start using the soil from my raised bed in my starting mix. So, the <coughs> soil is going to be the same here as it is in my in my raised bed. Um, what I like to do is, you know, fill the six pack to maybe within like a half inch maybe. It's not precise. You can see I, some, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But I, I try and keep it consistently the same amount of soil. And I will saturate that soil really well before planting. I just want to make sure that the whole cell is moist. And just let it drain for maybe, I don't know, an hour or two. It can go longer, but just make sure all the water is drained because during the germination process, think about the seed being full of nutrients. And as soon as you put that seed into the soil, there's bacteria and fungus that are looking for something sweet to eat, looking for carbohydrates. And seeds are full of sugar and carbohydrates that will nourish certainly bacteria and fungus. So minimizing fungus and bacteria is one of your, your goals. So when you overwater your seedlings, you're creating an environment that's more beneficial to fungus and molds and bacteria than it is for your actual plant. The important thing to know is that the seed itself, well, the seed itself requires just a little bit of moisture. 
to penetrate that seed coat to start that germination process. So you don't need a whole lot of water. You just need it to be damp initially, and then make sure the seed is, is covered with a little bit of soil. And for most small seeds, like for mustard, shiso seeds, I just tamp it into the soil. I don't bury the seed. Because when you think about the natural processes, the seeds will drop from the flower or from the seed pod onto the ground. Maybe it gets scattered a little bit, but the seeds themselves don't get pushed into the soil. They're always close to the surface for the most part. So I tend to keep my seeds maybe a quarter inch at the most with, with soil for smaller seeds. And it's because the seeds have to get to the surface. So the small seeds, if you put in too much, too deep in the soil, a lot of energy will be spent trying to get to the surface, to the sun, and you're just kind of setting them back a little bit. So moisture is important. And so the other thing I try and do is I water in the morning only. I water in the morning only because I'm going to have the seeds or the seedlings probably either on a heating pad or going to be outdoors in full sun. And this, the sun will, and the, just the dryness of the air, will evaporate a lot of that moisture during the day. But when you water at night, you're creating an environment where there's moisture, it's going to be a little bit cooler at night, temperatures are going to drop a little bit, and you're creating a, an environment that's more beneficial for fungus mildew and mold and things like that. And I keep coming back to this because probably the, the number one complaint that we get is the seeds germinated and then they just kind of flopped over and died. Well, that's because there's this fungus called damping off fungus, and I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, it's when you, your seedling will get maybe this tall, and then all of a sudden it just kind of droops and then it falls over. And if you look closely at the stem of the seedling, it will be, it'll come like this and it'll get indented a little bit and then it goes out again. So that little constricted area is where the damping off fungus <coughs> basically killed it. And again, it was caused by overwatering. There's too much moisture that allowed the fungus to get established. The other thing I try and do is don't water directly on the seedling itself. Water on the outside edge, if possible. Because again, the more moisture on the plant could create an environment for fungus to attack. But if you water to the outside edge of the container, <coughs> the plant itself will be dry. But the natural process of water migrating through the soil, it'll fan out a little bit but it's going to get to the roots. And in my mind, it's more important to get the water to the roots than it is to get water on the stem where it can be attacked by uh, fungus or, or other pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, do you take the um, seedlings off the heating pan once they germinate? Um, as a demonstration purposes, these seedlings are, are too small. I mean, you can try and transplant them, but they're really delicate. The, it's, um, you're putting the plants at risk. These seedlings are, are probably a little bit overgrown, but they're going to have a nice root system. And so I'll probably pull these out this weekend, divide them up very gently, keeping as much of the root system together, and pop them into the soil. So these are probably the right size for transplanting. But again, plants don't get ready for transplanting on your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you have to wait a little bit, but um, they won't But you can take them off the heating pad and plant some more? Yeah, as soon as they germinate, I take them off the heating pad. It depends on the weather. Because sometimes, you know, if I know that it's going to get really cold, I'm going to bring my seedlings indoors at night. 
I'm going to baby them a little bit because I don't want to shock them by having like a frost. Frost will kill a plant. Cold temperatures at night just reduces the whole metabolic process. And so temperatures below 50 degrees, uh, just you're, you're torturing the plants. They're not going to grow. And then there's not enough time to kind of catch up during the daytime because the daytimes are going to be on the cool side as well. So I will bring seedlings in if it gets cold. And then when it gets warmer, I mean, this time of year, it, it, two weeks ago, it was really cold outside. So I brought seedlings in. From here on out, I'm not going to bother because the temperature is not going to, knock on wood, not going to freeze. In San Jose area, there's a chance you might get a frost, but I mean, with each passing day, the, the risk of frost increases. So you can put your seedlings out. So, uh, do you go through a hardening process? Like, I, I printed out an a information from the UC Master Gardeners mm -hmm. that talks about, you know, hardening the seedlings. Do you do that? Or some people are very religious about it. And what's your thoughts? Time is a constraint for me, so I don't necessarily harden them off, but I think in my process of, of you know, moving them indoors and outdoors as needed, uh, for the most part they're outdoors in full sun for most of the day. Um, that's about as hardening as you want to do. So in, indirectly, uh, I'm probably doing it, but Consciously, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, what about starting uh, seeds in containers, in big containers, instead of putting them in the little seeds and then transplanting them into containers? So, uh, you can do that. You can put some, uh, grow them directly in a large container. Save it like with seed tapes or something? Like yeah. That. The, the question I would ask is, are you planning to then transplant it elsewhere, or are you going to just grow it? Keeping it in the container. In the container. Say, say if you have a yeah. big container, uh -huh. you know, like 12 or 16 uh -huh. inches, what would you suggest? So I've grown uh, cucumbers in containers. I've grown uh, squash in containers. I've grown different herbs in containers, you know, anywhere from one-gallon containers up to, like, 15-gallon size containers. Uh, they're big enough so that you can just, and again, depending on the temperatures, just start them outdoors and leave them there. But if you want to get a jump start on your planting, starting your seedlings indoors under artificial conditions, in my mind, is, a, is a, the best way to go. And put the, say, that transplant into the container, Correct. right? Correct. Say with a small amount of, say, but you're using, say, um, um, potting soil mm -hmm. in your container, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. But you'd still take the transplant with the natural... Mm -hmm. um, whatever, soil you, whatever soil you're going to transplant your seedling into, I would use that soil to start with. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, with container plantings, um, yeah, it's just a lot of work to kind of move them around and once you get it situated and if the weather's fine, I would just leave it alone. But one of the things about starting your seeds indoors is that you control the temperature and you control the rate at which the seedlings are being produced. And you can plant them at your convenience. So again, it's about developing a system for controlling things so you can manage it. And that's really what I, what I stress most is that you, you figure out how you want to do it, but you want to be consistent about it. And with consistent technique, you'll get consistent results. And with consistent results, you're going to be happy with the results because you can anticipate what's going to happen. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, make sure you label your seedlings. Because <laughs> as I said, you can look at these two different seedlings up here. And without the label, I'd be hard pressed to know which is which. They look identical. They're all in the same family. The ones that turn up and ones that down are Chinese cabbage. Um, so labels are important. I have a question. So I was looking at the seed 
And so is the year, um, that's when we were passed, like 2016, this one says 2014, mm -hmm. uh, but it does say hand pack for season. So can you have a, if I find a pack of seed and the year, is it still usable in terms of the seeds or do they have a shelf life? Seeds like any other living organism, they do have a shelf life in a packet. Generally speaking, uh, we test our seeds through a laboratory. Under laboratory conditions, you'll get 85 to 90 percent germination. Um, but as soon as you put them, put seeds into a packet, they're exposed to the air. They're exposed, exposed to a range in temperatures. Uh, might spill a little coffee on it, so it's exposed to maybe some moisture. All these things can have a negative impact on seeds. And seeds, seeds will hold their viability for, for years and years if stored properly. There is a seed repository in Norway that's storing seeds from all over the world as kind of saving the genomes of various varieties. And it's a specialized place, but they're storing their seeds for like forever almost. Uh, the shelf life of seeds, the law says you have to pack, label them for, this, for the year that they're being sold. So that's a requirement of the law. Uh, what you'll find is an old pack of seed, if it's been stored in a cool, dry environment, like maybe in, this, in your garage or maybe in a cabinet someplace, Odds are the seed will still be viable. It's just that instead of an 80% germination rate, you might get only a 50% germination rate or 40% germination rate. But certain varieties like carrots, they tend to lose their viability really quickly. Chiso uh, will lose its viability fairly quickly. Um, radishes seem to keep their viability for, for years. Beans. Bees, they can keep their viability for years. So again, it varies on the species. Uh, but you know, if you have old seed, I would say go ahead and plant them, but just plant the seeds more thickly and see what happens. So you're saying once it's open, it says hand pack for season 2018. Mm -hmm. It could be garden in our backyard. We always find different things. Um, trying to figure out what what works, what doesn't work. Um, try and replicate things that our customers are going to be experiencing. So uh, I've, I've grown quite a few of our vegetables just as a test out of the curiosity to see does it germinate, what's it look like, what does it taste like, how do you use it. Um, right now I've got fava beans growing, I grow uh, rakio, um, I grow fuki. I've got a little bit of uh, wasabi in a little pot, the true wasabi. Um, I have some uh, nagai emo or yama emo growing. Um, I don't harvest it because I have to dig up the yard to get to it. Cabbages, pot choy, I mean, our, our garden is, has a lot of different things going on. And I grow basically all year round, uh, probably in our, our yard um, has a west westerly facing, so you have long afternoon sun. But the morning, because we're on a hillside, there's no morning sun at all until 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So because of that, I have to think about when's the best time to plant things, and so. I cannot grow tomatoes, I cannot grow peppers, I cannot grow eggplant uh, early in spring. I have to plant those uh, late June or sometimes even July because that's when the warmer season is and I get good strong sunshine and I'll get peppers to grow uh, which I'll harvest like in September. But I can't, I can't grow things early. So again, one of the things that you have to think about for your own personal garden <coughs> is follow where the sun goes, where are the shades, where are the hot spots. Every, every yard has a microclimate and it's really important that you take the time and just study it. 
just look at and go, okay, it's winter time now. Where is the sun in the morning? Where is the sun in the afternoon? Where is the sun in the middle of the day? Where is it shaded? Because over time, I mean, in the summertime, it's going to be different. The sun's going to be rising at a different angle. It's going to set at a different angle. Um, it changes uh, what you can grow. So these are things that you have to kind of take your time and observe. Because if you want, like I said, consistent results, you have to have control over the conditions. I think we can all give Jim a round of applause here. Mm -hmm. people a chance to plant some seeds. Sure. So, um, yeah, so uh, possibly we're doing this all wrong, but, <laughs> but I, I know there's people here who are really experienced like, like bombing. So anyway, so uh, we, we have these uh, little containers and um, if, if you like, you can put these coffee filters in the bottom to keep the uh, dirt from falling out. And then I also I have yeah. some uh, potting soil in these buckets over here. It's been pretty moistened, um, so you don't have to water your uh, seedlings right away. And, and oh yeah, and we also have gloves, so you can just reach in and get the dirt and potting soil and put it in your container. Um, and uh, everybody got their own uh, packet of seeds, but there's a variety in the room, so. Um, we provided these little envelopes in case you want to share seeds with somebody else. And there are some marking pens uh, somewhere. Uh, oh, in the back of that table that you can mark the, uh, the label in the air. And you know, um, Jim mentioned that it's probably a good idea to, to label your plants. And so, so I was thinking that since we don't have like little labels, but you can draw a grid on your piece of paper and you know label what you plant. So, uh, <laughs> well, I brought those because that's what I do some more. I don't think it's that short. So, I don't know if it's for all of you, but you may not be. Yeah, that's